Well, hello everyone and welcome. As some folks have already done in the chat, feel free to introduce yourselves, your affiliation, uh, and where you're hailing from in the chat. Lovely to see people doing that so far. Uh, but mostly, welcome to the fifth in a series of webinars as part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Project. This project from Kairos Canada is funded by the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Workers Program. My name is David Ivany, and I'm part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers team, and I'm honored to facilitate this webinar today. Also joining me from the Migrant Justice team at Kairos are Alfredo and Connie. We have Shannon, and I believe Cheryl is in as well. Uh, and we are all happy to welcome you to this. So. Uh, yes, please continue introducing yourselves in the chat. Uh, your microphone has been muted and we ask that as we move into the presentations that you please keep your microphone muted. Um, and please hold your questions for the Q&A after the presentation. We don't want them to get lost in the uh, early parts of the presentation. So I know you have a lot of questions, but please hold on to them until we get to the Q&A. Uh, and a reminder that we will be recording this session. So if you do not wish to appear in the recording, feel free to turn your camera off. Uh, and if you do not wish to be uh, heard in the recording, please uh, ask your questions in the chat uh, and I will move them into the uh, presentation. Uh, we will begin recording with our land acknowledgement, which is now. So, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree Nation, the Métis, the Diné, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota Nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all of the nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples where I am now. This webinar will explore the ways that people can get involved and safely support migrant workers during the pandemic. Our panelists will discuss ways to make a difference in the lives of migrant workers and share their experience creating spaces for support and relationship building. To start our discussion today, it is my pleasure to introduce Jane Andrus. Born and raised in Niagara, Jane has operated Applewood Hollow B&B for the last 22 years. Educating her guests about the importance of supporting local farms and serving hearty country breakfasts from produce grown in her own neighborhood is one of her passions. Through the process of organizing music for church service, she became aware of a sense of invisibility and lack of connection to the local community that the migrant workers in her area were experiencing. Since awakening to the experiences of migrant workers in Canada, Jane has been involved in organizing concerts, picnics, and delivering welcome bags to temporary foreign workers in the Niagara region. Um, and we are going to further explore the work that Jane has done through a short video.
Jane Andre's B&B is on Four Mile Creek Road, which winds through some of Ontario's most fertile farmland here in Niagara. Migrant workers often drive down the road on their bicycles, their main means of transportation. Later in the season, when the peaches are ripe, they'll be driving jitneys loaded with fruit. For years, Jane noticed them, but didn't really see them. And I'm sure I'm like, I was like most locals in that you avoided going to the bank or the grocery store on Thursday nights just because they're all there. Everybody's hanging around waiting for a ride for the farmer to pick them up afterwards. And yeah, and that means long lines in the bank. And Hello, sir. The, the long store. lineups were just part of it. Some of it was because of more ancient barriers of skin color and nationality. When people hear the term migrant workers, um, it, it can conjure up images of the dirty 30s and the terrible poverty of farmers in that era. What, what did you find when you went to Niagara? You know, I found, I guess, a more modern version of poverty, a, a poverty of community and a sense of belonging. Migrant workers in Ontario actually earn a pretty decent living by the standards of the countries they come from. They're, they're here under a federal government program called Farms. They're paid minimum wage. It went up 75 cents this year to 10.25 an hour. Hour. They're covered by OHIP and workers' comp, and the housing is decent. You know, it's inspected once a year by public health officials. Detailed regulations for space requirements, kitchens, sewage, showers, mm -hmm. all this kind of thing. But where I found real poverty was around a sense of belonging, a, a, a poverty as real and maybe as debilitating as the financial kind. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, it struck me. These men are away from home for a long time. Some of them arrive as early as February to help prepare the fields for planting. Many won't go home until late October. So they're away from home for all but four months, really, of the year. Paul Chambers is one of them. He has two children aged eight and 12. And I asked him what it's like to have to leave them behind every year. If uh, if they're 8 and 12 and you've been doing this all your life, you it must always be a little bit hard. <laughs> very much, very much. You know, um, it's time leaving them. It costs me so much tears to know that I have to leave them. But a good part of it, whenever time I went home back, it's always been a like a, a joyful setting. Everybody happy to know that I'm home again. Whenever time I'm ready to leave, it brings sadness to the heart. That's that's a way of survival. Come in. To Paul. For him, survival means leaving home to support his own family. So I began thinking about what that sense of community means when you're away from home for so long, because many of these guys feel virtually invisible when they come up here. You know, they're rarely included in the community or made to feel welcome. Jane Andres described it to me. She runs a B&B &B in Niagara on the Lake, and she told me about a conversation with one migrant worker, a woman from Mexico, who said, you know, it's not the hard work we mind. It's that we feel invisible. And she said her eyes filled with tears as she was talking about what that feels like. And it made me think, so what exactly is the definition of a community or a family? Do you know, does it mean that you have to be there 365 days of the year? Do you have to own a house there? Can you come and go? Yeah. And, you know, when she says family, of course, I think about Paul, uh, whom we heard earlier, and, and what he misses the most, right, when he comes yeah. up here. Yeah. And Jane began looking for other ways to connect to these guys. So in August, she stuck a Jamaican flag on the fence in front of her B&B with a big banner, one word on the banner, thank you. And she said people began stopping. Yeah, and it was a couple of hours later, I went back out and I was doing some watering, and then this uh, jitney stopped, it's pulling, it's loaded down with peaches. And this big guy gets out, and he goes, man, what's that for? And I said, it's to say thank you. He goes, for what? I says, for all that you do for us. You're picking our fruit. If it wasn't for you guys, our farms wouldn't exist. Jane began helping out, playing accordion at a Sunday evening service for migrant workers, inviting the men back to her house to meet her husband, another musician, and rehearsing music together. And she even 
began traveling to Jamaica, visiting the men one by one in remote farm villages in the Blue Mountains. Okay. <laughs> See, there you are. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the neighbors. Take me high above the mountain. Like when you go to the top of a mountain in Jamaica and you have to walk up <laughs> to the top part because the road stops and you go up into the clouds and you find him working there so hard and you meet his wife and you look out from his front porch as you sip coconut water and you see this incredible incredible view then when he comes by and rides his bike by your house you you've got a sense of relationship and um today jane makes a point of shopping at the value mart in niagara on a thursday evening it's just such exuberance and excitement oh that doesn't happen often when you're getting groceries but yeah and you become you become family and this is kemar and you know what And now to talk about supporting migrant workers through COVID, but also generally, uh, here is Jane Andrews. Hello, everyone. This is my first time doing it, and I'm kind of winging it because that's the story of my life. But um, if any of you are interested in watching um, the video with a bit smoother video. Um, it is available on the Workers Welcome Niagara website. Just click on the top red button to learn more about our story. And there's a series of videos. Um, the videos were actually, um, well, this one was made about 10 years ago, 2010, with um, CBC Radio had done the Working Man series, which featured the story of uh, farm workers in Niagara, and what we were doing as a community to try to strengthen those relationships. And um, it was a radio series. I bought a Mac and taught myself how to use iMovie and just made it myself with own clips. Um, one of the odd blessings, I suppose, in not getting funding for any of this is just, it forces us to uh, learn a lot of new skills and develop our own resources. And so it's been uh, a really exciting 15 years just trying to find ways to build community without um, financing or funding. And it has been really an incredible journey. And I'm very grateful for 15 years of experience before COVID hit, 
because our relationships, there's already a lot of really deep relationships in the community. There's already a lot of trust um, in our relationships with the farm workers. So when COVID hit, we did have um, pathways to be able to communicate with them in quarantine and on the farms and um, gave us a bit of a platform to start working from. Whereas communities that are just now becoming aware, there's really a struggle saying, well, how do we connect with people on the farms? We aren't allowed on the property. They're not going shopping. How do we find them? So I can really appreciate the struggle with trying to start after COVID has already um, taken root in our communities. And um, I, I think what has been my um, experience, I first began through music and my journey actually started when I was given the task of connecting with local churches to try to get volunteers to help out at the Caribbean Workers Church Service. And, um, and the mystery that kind of evolved to me, why was there resistance in the church? Why was there just the impulse that they would write a check but not get involved? And so that's really been my journey the last 15 years is to try to uh, strengthen relationships uh, within neighborhoods, realizing that when they're your neighbor, they're not a project. It's a, all about relationship. And it's been a huge challenge um, the last 15 years to get, because I'm assuming this is largely a faith-based audience that is affiliated with some church or that type of thing. Um, it, the, the struggle has been to see beyond the project idea and go deeper into relationship. And there has just been a lot of resistance for that and continues to be resistance. And um, I thought at first it was just a local thing, um, but even the one fellow in the video who was um, singing along with a guitar, he got um, transferred to British Columbia and he wanted to go to church out there. It took me all season, six months. I, I Googled him, went on the map, saw all of the Mennonite churches he was surrounded with in Pitts Meadows, BC. And in six months, I could not find one person to take him to church. And because they didn't have ministries to farm workers, they could not see him as a person that just needed a ride to church. And so that's been my um, passion and my quest to try to understand the roots of racism, not just in the Mennonite churches, but in all of the churches that tend to be in rural communities and to see how we can go deeper and um, build relationships neighbor to neighbor. And perhaps one of the very thin silver linings with COVID is the fact that the churches had their doors locked and now they're forced to love their neighbors if they want to express their faith. So maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this is a new opportunity. And as Christians, I think um, we, we serve a God who is a redeemer and who can help us see beyond our own little boxes. And maybe COVID is the opportunity to break free of some of these restrictions to force us out of church walls and to be walking the neighborhood because Right now, that's the only thing safe to do. <laughs> they encourage people to get out and walk. And that has what has made an impact just in my own rural neighborhood, semi-rural. People are getting out and I'm able to introduce them to farm workers in the neighborhood. There's some really cool friendships and connections that are developing, not only with the farm workers, but because other neighbors are watching the interaction with farm workers on the road in front of their houses where we are allowed to have conversations. Um, it's impacting our neighborhood, which is really quite exciting. So um, that being said, that's all just a bit of background about where I'm coming from. So it's something that would involve people that have no faith, but just by virtue of being neighbors, by living in Ontario, you can be part of this support and um, healthy community. So um, just um, a very brief word about what the farm workers are experiencing this year with COVID. I'll just have to jump past a lot of other information, but um, it's it's been a very frightening experience for them this past year. 
And um, even with news of the vaccinations, it can, it, um, instead of it being good news, it's also a huge stress factor for them. And um, we can be very happy to get the vaccine, but they have different levels of concerns and historical experiences that impact their view. So I find right from the, the stress for coming to Canada starts um, when they are given their date to leave and they have to, they have to um, prepare to come. For many, their flight start, they, they have to leave at one or two in the morning from their homes. I will just speak about Jamaicans. With Mexicans, it'll take two or three days of travel. With Jamaicans, they may leave at two or three in the morning or possibly the night before. Um, some just sleep on the concrete at the Ministry of Labor in Jamaica if it's hot. Um, and so when they, by the time they get to the Ministry of Labor, get on the plane, uh, they are already exhausted. And um, so then there's waiting several hours at the airport. So many of them have had uh, almost 24 hours of travel by the time they arrive at Pearson Airport. Now what's happening as of this past week, they are being presented with, um, with the possibility of being vaccinated right then and there, which is frightening to them. They're extremely hungry. Many have not eaten for 24 hours. They're sleep deprived. And now someone's telling them they should be getting vaccinated. And so right away, they're just putting up barriers and saying, no, we need to get to a bed. We need some food. We need to get out of here. Not a third lineup. They have to line up for customs. They have to line up for COVID testing. It's two o'clock in the morning. They want to go lie down somewhere. And um, so that's, that's a very real concern for them and their voices are not being heard. Um, when they do arrive, when they arrive at the airport, they don't know, are they going to their bunkhouse, to the farm? Are they gonna be shipped off to a hotel? How will they be treated in the hotel? Will they get enough food? That's, um, that's a big concern because of what happened in our area last year. Workers arrived and on some farms, they went without food for two days. And to make it worse, they weren't believed. Um, and it created a whole raft of problems once that was reported. Um, so they have a lot of concerns. Will I get enough food? Will it be healthy food that's given to me in the hotels? Will I be able to get outside and walk around? And um, so the hotel conditions are a concern, especially where they're not getting proper food. And I know in the Niagara area, some of us have tried to bring in meals to them, but that's just a Band-Aid. It's just helping them for that particular day. It's not solving the problem, but people are afraid to speak up about the conditions in the hotel. They can't open a window, they can't get exercise. It's, it's all things that elevate their stress. So um, what myself and some of our friends and uh, we have kind of a dream team that has worked together thanks to our Kairos grant where a number of us are partnering together and becoming um, a much more effective um, way of reducing some of these fears is by um, contacting a lot more farms through our, um, through our uh, coordinated communications and so on. But um, through the four or five of us, we really try to connect personally with the farm workers. Um, it takes a lot of work to get an updated WhatsApp number or to be able to communicate. So we, we really share with each other how best to do that, who's covering which farms, who's bringing meals, where is there a need? Where do we need to pray? There's a pastor who's involved now. The church wants to know where there's prayer needs and um, what they can do to provide food or practical services. So just be able, being able to um, deal with some of the isolation issues and those fears is really, really huge. And again, it's based on relationships that we have been building on for many years. But now if there's a group that we can work with and trust um, as we are with this Kairos group now that we're working with, um, that has really um, helped improve communications, sharing our networks. And so if somebody has a health problem, someone else can help manage it. It has made things incredibly difficult when we are not allowed to go onto the farms during quarantine, understandably so. But 
um, it has really uh, created uh, levels of concern and stress that have never existed before. Um, and again, the main thing is we don't want them to feel that isolation so intensely. We want them to know that there is help for physical needs. But things become e extremely complicated quickly. And I'll just tell you a quick story. And then, um, yeah, and then I'm not too sure if you want to open it to questions or if there's another presenter. But one example, how quickly things can escalate or how much cooperation it takes. One of the fellows in quarantine required some x lax You know, you haven't been eating properly. There's, it's fairly often on the farms that guys will need products such as that. And, um, and, but then how do we get it to him? Because he's in a house directly behind the employer where there's a lot of issues and a lot of problems. If we give it directly to the employer, will he use it to, to mock the guy because he has a problem or he just withhold it. Like it's, the concerns are crazy. So um, I opened it up to other members of the team. How can we solve this problem? Can we just dump it in the employer's mailbox and hope he gives it to him or, and it ended up that we brought chicken dinners to that farm and were able to bring it in with a chicken dinner, but it cost us like, I, I don't know, it was about 200 and some dollars in chicken dinners to get the X-lax on the farm <laughs> and, and three people working as a team to make this happen. Whereas if it was a Canadian, you would just drop it in a mailbox and problem solved, right? But it took a lot of stress on ourselves. How can we get this to them without jeopardizing and without anybody knowing exactly what's going on? And it was stressful, but it was also very exciting. So exciting that we could make this happen as opposed to not happen. But that's the different hoops we have to jump through to just solve a simple problem. So it requires a lot of flexibility, a lot of cooperation, a lot of input from other people to solve some of these problems, but then also to share in the success that somebody's feeling a lot better today because we were all able to work together and make it happen. Um, and I think, um, yeah, a couple of the fears, some of the main fears of the workers on the farms are dealing with the fear of being left alone. If there's something happens, will anybody know? Um, they can't communicate easily because a lot of the regular salespeople from Toronto cannot come onto the farm because of quarantine. Um, some employers will call the salesperson ahead of time. The guys arrive, all their SIM cards are waiting on the table. They can pop them in their phones and call their families right away. There are those employers that look ahead and plan for the comfort and safety and well-being, sense of well-being with their employees. Other ones, like the previous one, uh, you have no way to communicate with them. They can't get their SIM cards. They don't, they don't have cell phones hooked up. So for two weeks, they have no communication with their family. Now, how will that feel when you're from St. Vincent and there's a volcano? <laughs> the guys from St. Vincent arrived last week after a week's journey. They left St. Vincent a week ago were evacuated by ship, were in a hotel in St. Lucia, separated from their families, wondering what is going on, finally arrived here exhausted. For men from in those situations to arrive and have no communication with their family, you can imagine how frightening that is. So what I have been working on for the last couple of years and pushing for is to provide Wi-Fi hotspots at no charge to the farms um, for the duration of the season, not just for a week's loan, but for, for the full duration of the season. And every year I've been turned down saying we can only afford two. So yesterday I went to the Rotary. They wanted to make a donation to welcome kits, which I said, can we divert it to hot spots? And so last night the Rotary came up with three, um, the funding for three hot spots for three farms, which is amazing after a couple of years. But you can imagine when you come here worried about communication and you've got the hot, hot spot there and right away you can call your family. And I think that's something if people are not connected with farms, they can start partnering with organizations like Rotary, um, with Kairos, with various community organizations 
to um, to find out which farms are is the um, internet provided for, which aren't. They can find that out from an employer if they don't know the employees, and then just see how can they do this as a gift for the community to get started. And then they'll have the ability to connect with the guys as well. So when this COVID blows over, you've got some people, you've got some relationships. So there is some possibilities for things like that. Um, you can have some meals delivered to the farms. So once the guys are finished quarantine and can start work, uh, their days are long. I've been hearing from a lot of guys who their days are exceptionally long because they've been held up for a month because of quarantine, all the paperwork. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stress because the weather's, the blossoms are finally coming on and now we're getting snow. So there's a lot of stress by with employers and their employees. Will there be a harvest? Um, and yeah, so because they're working long hours to deliver a meal from an approved restaurant, pre-approved from the employer, which is generally not a problem, um, especially if they're packaged by the restaurant. Um, yeah, so they, I think alleviating their fears that they're going to be alone, providing meals, just dropping them off, prearranging. Um, and another main concern related to COVID right now is the vaccines. Sorry, I feel like I'm pushing a lot of information out here, but there's a lot going on. But um, every single farm worker I've talked to is very concerned about the vaccine, some because of misinformation, but a lot are prepared to get it, but they have very concerns, very real concerns that are not being addressed, such as if I get side effects, um, they're not that worried about having chills or fever for two days. What they're worried about is having to lose work because of it. And then their family's not getting enough to eat that week because they were off work. So, and these are questions that the employers and the government are not answering. What happens if I do get sick short-term? What happens if I get sick long-term? What happens if I get a blood clot? Am I going to be abandoned? And we all have experiences even just recently where, um, and, and a lot of them are not sure what the relation is between blood clot and a stroke. But for example, um, one of our friends on the farms had a stroke about three weeks ago. Um, now, fortunately, he did get to the hospital in a good amount of time where other farm workers that we've been involved with have not been. But um, it was a week in the hospital before he even got a voice message on his phone from the liaison officer. He's still not sure what his what is the damage? Um, nobody's really taken time out to explain to him in a way he can understand. And it took over a week of him being in a hospital bed before he even picked up his phone and got like 20 second message from the liaison officer, which was not reassuring at all. So when they're worried about getting a blood clot or a stroke because of the vaccine, they know they are gonna be on their own. And so for us to reassure them, we are not going to let these things happen. We are standing with you. And because we do have a history in Niagara of things happening where we have really stood with farm workers and refused to let them go home to the point of having them live in our homes, um, they know that we're willing to put our money where our mouth is and that's very reassuring for them. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, what's happening down here. I'm sure there's more questions people have, which we can ask later if you like. Thank you so much for that. I've learned quite a bit through this and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, that'll be coming up right after our next presenter. So thank you so much, Jane. Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Stacy Gomez. Stacy Gomez is a community organizer active in the migrant justice movement. She is a member of No One is Illegal Halifax, uh, Chibuktuk, uh, supporting with the Migrant Workers Program. Since 2016, Stacy has also worked with a maritime space network engaged in solidarity with human rights defenders in Guatemala. Her writing has appeared in the Nova Scotia Advocate and the Media Co-op, The Coast, and The Chronicle Herald. Thank you, Stacy, for joining us today. Thanks so much. And thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks also, Jane. I haven't met you yet, but it's great to meet you virtually. Um, and 
Definitely a lot of things uh, that Jane shared uh, also resonate uh, with our experience here. Uh, so I'm based here in Halifax and uh, we work uh, throughout Nova Scotia in support of migrants, including migrant workers. Uh, so yeah, I'll just share a little bit about us. Um, so through our migrant workers program, we're engaged in outreach, uh, advocacy, public education, and direct support uh, with migrant workers uh, in our communities here. Um, we're also part of the Migrant Rights Network, uh, which is a network of migrant justice organizations throughout the country that are calling for full and permanent immigration status for all migrants, including migrant workers. Uh, so here in Nova Scotia, there are about 2000 migrant workers uh, that come each year, uh, working in the agriculture sector and also in seafood processing. Uh, they're uh, from Jamaica and Mexico, uh, and uh, some have been coming here for 10 years or more. Uh, and so, uh, as Jane has highlighted as well, uh, we do really emphasize that migrant workers are part of our communities. Um, and, you know, with COVID-19, it's really highlighted uh, the important uh, work of essential workers, uh, which um, migrant workers are as well. They contribute um, incredibly to uh, our food system. Um, so I do uh, want to talk about what's going on uh, with migrant workers doing, during COVID-19, um, but I think to talk about that, it's also important to talk about uh, what, what, what's been going on pre-COVID-19. Uh, so uh, here um, in Nova Scotia uh, and throughout Canada, uh, Mexican uh, migrant workers uh, have made uh, complaints to the Mexican Labor Ministry. Uh, so between 2009 and 2018, uh, there were 89 uh, complaints to the Labor Ministry registered uh, from Mexican workers working on Nova Scotia farms. Uh, so that includes uh, for issues such as uh, wage theft, uh, poor and inadequate housing, uh, and so on. Um, and we've also uh, seen over the years uh, heavy surveillance of migrant workers, migrant workers uh, being told that they're not allowed to speak to Canadians. Uh, we've uh, seen uh, food insecurity. Um, and uh, to quote a friend of mine uh, who's a Jamaican migrant worker, he says, if we should eat right based on the pay we're getting, most of us would just die out there. Uh, so he talks about how they, uh, they shop at Dollarama, for example, uh, in order to get uh, food that's uh, less expensive so that they can send more money back home. Um, and he, there's also ongoing health and safety concerns uh, related to the conditions of uh, living and working conditions. Um, so this includes exposure uh, to pesticides, insecure transportation, uh, lack of safety equipment, and so on. Um, and there's also racism faced uh, from the community and also from the employer. Uh, so I remember one uh, Mexican uh, migrant worker that I met, uh, I was speaking to him about the work that we do. And he was saying, <clears throat> he was telling me that one time uh, he and some other workers went into town uh, to go grocery shopping and just uh, someone randomly started berating them uh, in, in a racist manner. And he told me, <laughs> which is, I, I think, important for for all of us uh he told me what are you going to do about that um so i think that's important to ask ourselves what are we going to do in our communities to challenge racism that's a overt form of racism but there's also other other kinds of racism that we see through this program as well uh so for example uh um my friend who made this comment about the food also told me uh, an example of how uh, he he was working and uh, one of his colleagues was on a tractor. Um, I think it was a tractor. And he uh, he went into the ditch and the his uh, their boss came and said, oh, were there any apples in the bin? Uh, not concerned at all about the well-being of the worker who got into the accident, uh, who fell in the ditch. Um, so that's another example uh, that my friend shared, and he, he told me, my employer is a racist. Um, and so uh, that's one example, but there's also, uh, you know, workers being told that if they speak out, 
um, that they uh, that they aren't going to be allowed to come back in the future, and that there are many other workers that would take their place. And so that's another form of racism uh, to say that they're uh, expendable as 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 workers as people. Um, and importantly, um, it, when we talk about racism, uh, it's also important to talk about the structure of the program uh, that, you know, these workers, as I said, some have been coming here for uh, many, many years, but they're still considered temporary uh, and they don't have access to permanent residence uh, through this program. Um, and so uh, that really uh, puts them in a vulnerable situation. Uh, they're also, they don't have uh, the right, as many of us do, to to leave uh, their employment easily. Uh, they, uh, so that puts them in the vulnerable situation where they're tied to one employer. Uh, if they speak out about any of the conditions that I mentioned, they risk being fired, uh, returned to their home country and barred from the program uh, in the future. Um, and uh, so there's an application that they can make uh, if, they're in a, if they're vulnerable workers, if facing abuse. Um, but, you know, they have to apply apply for that, and there's a lot of documentation and such, and it's not given that they'll receive it. So uh, so this is the situation pre-COVID. And with COVID-19, uh, these conditions have been exacerbated. So, for example, uh, here in Nova Scotia uh, last year, uh, there were reports in the news, uh, and also we received reports as well of migrant workers not being allowed to leave uh, the farm, uh, which is their workplace. Uh, and also, uh, they live in employer-provided housing, uh, so the employer has a lot of a lot of uh, exerts a lot of power in this situation. Um, also, uh, we heard of uh, workers facing uh, wage theft. Uh, they faced intimidation uh, when uh, an inspector came, um, and they were told that if they uh, told the truth about what was happening on the farm, that they would be uh, that they would be uh, sent back. Uh, there were, they also spoke out about safe, or rather, they made a complaint about unsafe living and working conditions there. And we know that uh, with COVID-19, uh, with uh, over, uh, overcrowded housing, uh, that really is an increased threat to the health of migrant workers um, with the pandemic. Um, and uh, we've also, uh, with this limitation on the freedom of movement, uh, this also impacts uh, their ability to uh, send money home, uh, to get uh, groceries, and to connect to social supports. Uh, and so, uh, in addition, uh, we are also hearing uh, of workers in quarantine going hungry. Um, so that's uh, due to a number of factors, including uh, poor quality food uh, and lack of access to culturally relevant food. Um, and uh, we also, uh, here in Nova Scotia, uh, last year, uh, one, we heard of one worker who became sick with COVID-19. Uh, and uh, this year, we've heard more recently of eight workers uh, becoming sick with COVID-19 in the province. And it really highlights that uh, migrant workers risk their lives to come here. They risk their lives to provide for their families and for themselves. Uh, we know that they contribute enormously to our food system and our communities. Uh, and yet too often they're seen as a threat, uh, as a health threat um, because of xenophobia. Um, and so, uh, so that's something uh, that is ongoing. Um, and also we have been uh, part of ongoing advocacy calling for access to vaccines uh, for everyone. Uh, and in, in Nova Scotia, migrant workers have been identified as a priority uh, for, I believe it's phase two of of the vaccine rollout, uh, but we don't have uh, very much information on uh, when that's going to happen. Um, and so uh, we're still, uh, yeah, we're still uh, advocating uh, around that. Um, however, workers are also um, being told, uh, some workers are being told that if they don't get the, uh, the vaccine, then they won't be invited back in the future. Uh, so there's a common theme in a lot of what I'm saying is the threat of not being uh, able to come back um, because of the structure of this program, uh, which, which is exacerbated during COVID-19. Um, so I do want to share a few, uh, just a few pictures, a few slides. So I'm going to open that up right now. 
Okay. Hmm, it's not coming up. Just one moment. Okay, perfect. Alrighty. Um, so I want to talk a bit about um, the work that we do in support of migrant workers in solidarity with migrant workers in Nova Scotia. Uh, so a few, a few of the things that we do, uh, so we're engaged in direct support and accompaniment to migrant workers, uh, for example, uh, with issues around uh, immigration uh, and labor related issues in the workplace. Uh, we also uh, provide emergency support to migrant workers, uh, including uh, with access to food. Uh, we are partnering with other organizations in the community to deliver uh, Know Your Rights workshops for migrant workers uh, in, in Spanish uh, and also uh, in English uh, with the support of, uh, of a volunteer uh, who speaks Patois as well. Uh, we are engaged in mutual aid. Uh, and so um, here on this slide, uh, there's a few examples. Uh, so we have a migrant solidarity fund, uh, which is fully funded by community members and local organizations. And uh, we have this fund uh, for emergency situations for migrants in the community. Uh, and it's also available uh, to migrant workers as well. Uh, it's a small fund uh, because we're also a small group. So um, we're, we're working on growing this fund because we know that there is, uh, yeah, we've, are, we've received a number of requests already. Also uh, earlier this year, we uh, supported a um, migrant worker who's been coming to Nova Scotia for close to 10 years uh, when his family house in Jamaica burned down. Thankfully, uh, everyone, uh, his family uh, was safe. Um, and so we helped uh, to raise over $10,000 in support of his family to rebuild. Um, and they're in ongoing need. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been challenging. Um, and we really uh, put out this fundraiser, recognizing really it is based on this idea and um, this idea, uh, I don't want to say idea, I mean, it's based on the fact that migrant workers are part of our communities, even though they're not here uh, year round, that they are here eight or nine months of the year. Uh, and so we know that if someone's house burned down uh, here in our community, that we would see a big outpouring of support. And so we also put this out to the community, uh, hoping uh, for an outpouring of support. And we were uh, definitely uh, touched uh, all of us uh, to see that incredible outpouring of support. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's one example of, of something that, that, uh, that falls under our mutual aid uh, support. Um, also, in terms of um, one of the things that's new that we're doing this year is that we're engaging members of the community to grow uh, culturally relevant seedlings um, so we're growing epazote for Mexican migrant workers and Kalalu uh, for Jamaican workers. And there are over 60 volunteers that are helping us to grow these seedlings that we're gonna uh, eventually give to migrant workers. Um, so that's something that's, uh, that's currently in the works. Um, and it's also uh, pretty amazing to see that amount of dedication from uh, the community. Uh, and we're trying to grow uh, hundreds of seedlings um, so this is an ongoing uh, project that we have. Uh, and really, um, and we're thinking uh, about, about this and whether we'd be able to do it again in the future. And it actually didn't cost very much money. I think in total was about $300 for all of the materials. So I think it is something that's, it is easy to replicate uh, in the future. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how it rolls out this year with our, this being our first year of doing this. Um, and uh, in addition, um, I would say uh, we are also engaged in, in ongoing advocacy uh, in, in support of migrants, including migrant workers. Uh, so here are a few pictures uh, highlighting some of, some of that work. Uh, so we have a, uh, a campaign calling for 
healthcare access for all migrants, including migrant workers. Uh, so migrant workers don't have access to public health care in Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, in one situation uh, last year, uh, we supported a migrant worker with access, getting access to workers' compensation when he uh, got into a, he was in a passenger in, a, in, a, in an accident. Uh, and it was within the context of work. And so uh, at that time, uh, his employer um, uh, took away his, his uh, they have access to private insurance, uh, took away the card. And so really, that really highlights the vulnerability of, of workers in terms of access to healthcare. Um, and uh, so we were able to, to find a way around that. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is something that's ongoing an ongoing call. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're uh, part of ongoing calls uh, for full and permanent immigration status for all, recognizing that it's the uh, quote unquote, it's a temporary immigration status of migrant workers um, that really uh, contributes and causes their vulnerability. And of course, as I mentioned, that's uh, tied to racism. Um, and so here is a picture. We did a postering uh, uh, blitz where we went to different um, different uh, places that are uh, important uh, symbolically. So here uh, we were at the local farmers market uh, with these posters saying migrant workers are part of our community, and we had a series of four uh, with different migrant communities. Uh, so that's uh, so that's a little bit about uh, our uh, advocacy. Um, and we've also done uh, public education, uh, such as uh, film screening um, and, and other events as well, uh, and as well as other activities. Um, so those are some highlights. Uh, and I added this slide here because I think, you know, people always want to know what, what can we do in our own uh, communities. And so here are a few suggestions. Uh, so one, uh, join, I put join or contribute to a migrant justice organization in your area. Um, it could be contributing in terms of volunteering, in terms of funds. I also should have put or start your own <laughs> as well, um, or a support group or uh, specifically for migrant workers or how, however, yeah, however you envision that. Um, we recently uh, re reached out to uh, by someone who's, who's thinking of starting uh, a group. Uh, another group, uh, which is really exciting uh, and beautiful to see that. Um, and <clears throat> number two, uh, connect with migrant workers in and around your community, uh, which is uh, challenging during COVID-19, um, but I think that there are still ways to do that. Um, so we're thinking, uh, like we've heard of other, uh, other groups, such as church groups uh, in the past hosting uh, community dinners with migrant workers uh, and the community, uh, which is really great for challenging uh, the sense of isolation uh, that, uh, that migrant workers uh, can feel um, and really highlighting the support in the community for migrant workers. Um, and we're thinking of doing something similar, but a barbecue outside because of COVID-19. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an idea. Um, and also uh, there are ongoing um, events uh, through, uh, this is through the Migrant Rights Network. Uh, so there are four upcoming days of action uh, where people uh, throughout the country are encouraged to uh, plan an event or participate in an event. And really as under this banner of full and permanent immigration status for all. Uh, so those are a few ideas. And this is our contact info. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stacey. A uh, lot of information there. We'll make sure to get your uh, contact info into the chat. Um, I've learned a lot and uh, looking forward to getting active with uh, some of your tips there. So thank you for your insights. Now is the time for questions and answers. Um, so um, in terms of if you want to ask a question, you can put it into the chat. Um, you can raise your hand through the reaction button, uh, and we will uh, put you in the queue. Um, and um, if 
<laughs> we should have plenty of time to get to all of your questions. Um, so feel free to put them in the chat and I will put them in order. I already have a few questions uh, that were asked earlier um, that I will put to the group. Um, and if anybody has insights, feel free. There's a wealth of knowledge, uh, not just from our presenters who we are very grateful for, but also in the room overall. Uh, so there was a question earlier uh, in Ontario, people 40 and over can now be vaccinated. Um, is the farm owner responsible for scheduling that workers' vaccinations? Or um, So if anybody has insights, please let me. Well, in Niagara, uh, things are kind of going full steam ahead with them being given priority. So the first ones received um, vaccinations from Trigano Farms. Um, yeah, if you, um, if you go on to the grower, the magazine, the grower uh, website, there is information on there about that, about how they're rolling it out to the farms and an interview with Phil Trigano as well. So approximately 70 of his men received the first vaccinations as part of the pilot. Uh, again, there was a lot of anxiety among the guys and uh, we received a lot of calls for that. But again, we reassured them that um, don't follow the headlines regarding the, the blood clot. It is still very, that seems to be the overriding thing. What if I get a blood clot and a stroke and who will help me if there's side effects? So when we let them know, um, historically speaking, when there have been crises on the farms, we have stood by injured workers and um, not let them disappear. So we said, we will be standing with you. Um, and, and as soon as I got my shot, I let, I've been letting the guys know. I created this little video, short, short, certain 30 second video, which I think I shared with you that um, we've been sharing around uh, via WhatsApp. They need reassurance. And um, the fact that the employer uh, took the first shot really made a difference too, because they figured, okay, if he's going to get it, he's not going to endanger himself and his family. So that was greatly reassuring for them. So this week will be the big push for vaccination on the farms in Niagara, at least, and I'm sure it's going to be spreading out across Ontario. It, it is up to the farmer, but I have to say um, the farmers, even though they are not able to reassure them saying, well, you're gonna get paid time off if you get side effects, but they are saying that this is your choice. So, but also historically guys know a choice is not really a choice. <laughs> you can choose not to, you just won't be coming back next year. So that's what's happening in our area. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Um, and I, um, so far I've, the timeline I've, uh, timeline I've been hearing here, which I haven't heard very much, is June uh, for the vaccination of migrant workers. So we don't have any details, uh, any more details on that. Thanks. Honey? Um, thank you so much, Jane and Stacy, for the very informative, you know, uh, sharing. Uh, I just want to add um, some information around vaccination. As James said, here in Ontario, this is already being rolled out. I understand that, that last Saturday, uh, there was, you know, a, a full kind of stream vaccination uh, done in Leamington. I also want to, you know, to share that there's two streams now. One, uh, for the workers who are already here, uh, that's, you know, uh, so it's through the farms and also kind of sharing that information and so forth. But for those workers who are who are just arriving, uh, vaccinations are done, you know, upon arrival. So it started, I think, not this Saturday, but the other Saturday, uh, workers coming in through the Pearson International Airport are, you know, are being bused or through the link brought to a vaccination area uh, near the airport before they are you know, they're picked up by, by their employers. So uh, just, you know, uh, to mention that. In Halifax, um, the, the kind of the Atlantic government is kind of coordinating, you know, among themselves yeah. in terms of being able to provide logistical support to the workers that are arriving 
and also kind of a mandated uh, quarantine in government approved facilities before uh, they are transported to, you know, or before they go to where they're supposed to go, whether it's in New Brunswick or uh, PEI or in Nova Scotia. Right now, there are two airports operating as port of entries. So this is Moncton and also Halifax. Um, there is, you know, a huge possibility for our community partners, you know, under this empowering temporary foreign uh, migrant workers project that our community partners are able to provide logistical support uh, in the airport uh, to workers who, you know, who are just arriving. So in Toronto, we might be able to start, you know, this airport support services uh, this, uh, this week while, you know, we're still, you know, negotiating, you know, for Halifax through Stacey and no one is illegal and possibly in Moncton. So just, you know, to share that information as well. Well, if I might just add, um, of all the workers that I talked to that arrived last week and um, they all turned down the vaccinations at the airport. They said they felt that was unfair to be presented with that when they were so, some of the guys, they said, we could hardly walk. We haven't moved for a couple hours. Now we've been in two different lineups for customs and COVID tests. We're shaking because we're so hungry. We don't want to get into another lineup for a vaccination. We just want to go lie down and get some food. And none of them accepted the vaccination. But talking to them today, they said we would have received a vaccination if we could have at least had a meal so we didn't have to stand and wait in another line. So some of them were not anti-vaccination, but they mm -hmm. all agree it's a bad idea at the airport. It's incredibly insensitive and it's not listening to what their needs are, which is food. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just one more example of them not being listened to. Even yeah. Phil Trigano, yeah. the uh, first farmer who got the pilot um, vaccination program going, he said, it's not a good idea, but the government is mm -hmm. not listening. I think Eduardo uh, from OCA wants to share additional information around vaccination. Um, yeah. Sure. Oh, oh sorry. Um, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, we've been quite trying to get uh, stay connected to all of the developments around the vaccine um, airport initiative. Similarly, we were quite concerned when we started hearing about the proposal for it. Uh, exactly what you're mentioning, Jane, in terms of just trying to figure out if that is, you know, not a, a space that sounds like it's very conducive to making sure things are done slowly and with a, a big focus on communication and answering people's questions. Um, so we provided a lot of feedback early on to some key contacts. Um, at uh, some of the groups involved, including OMAFRA. Um, so we provided uh, you know, a recognition of the importance of, of, of making sure workers were receiving information before they were offered the vaccine at the airport and if that, were gonna be, if that was gonna be happening. Um, then the initiative obviously started um, and, and uh, there's a, a staff person that uh, we work with and it, it also works with uh, uh, TNO, who's part of the network um, here who's been involved in those vaccines. And generally speaking, it's, it's, it's tough because I think, you know, um, we've heard a lot of positives from the, the Mexican worker community. Um, so uh, in terms of the people involved, they noted that a lot of the Mexican workers were really thankful to have uh, the vaccine available to them. Um, there, it sounded like there was still a lot of learning that happened in that initiative in terms of, uh, you know, from the get-go, some information was not necessarily being provided uh, right away and through more of, of doing the, the vaccination clinic, you know, certain things got identified and, and kind of looped into it. Um, I know workers do get a meal um, following the, the vaccine, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, we've been, we've been really trying to keep track of it because we, we are and continue to be concerned, but one of the biggest things too, so the Mexican government um, has been, so we produced a, a series of packages of, of resource packages that we've been distributing that have the vaccine information in them. 
um, as well as other COVID-19 safety uh, resources. And those have been printed and handed out to every worker um, while they're in line to get the vaccines in the airport. Um, and so at least that's some information. Then they have greeters uh, that then discuss the information with workers. And it sounds like questions to an extent are being, uh, you know, being answered. But again, um, you know, it, it's, yeah, far from, from perfect, I'm sure. Um, the, like you said, Jane, the, the one thing that was flagged was that there was quite a, or there was a difference between the acceptance uh, of the vaccine uh, among Mexican communities and among the Caribbean communities. So the first Caribbean flight that came in, um, it was from Trinidad and Tobago. And the, the rate of acceptance was quite lower. For the Mexican community, they, they had a really high acceptance of, of the vaccine at the airports is what, that, what uh, the, the ministry and the council uh, were reporting. The Trinidadian flight, I think, uh, had uh, an estimated around 60% acceptance uh, of the vaccine. So it was lower, whereas in uh, the Mexican flight was actually higher than that. It was, it was quite high. Um, higher than I think it was the regular population. So then again, there was uh, really a focus on ensuring that workers didn't feel pressured, that this wasn't part of an arrival requirement or things like that. That was really emphasized in what we said that it should be emphasized and it sounded like it, it is being emphasized. Um, and then maybe I'll stop ranting, but um, it's gonna, it's continuing um, and, and yeah. Yeah, um, I guess one, and sorry, the last couple things, and, and uh, I don't know if other colleagues are on the phone as well that might want to speak to this. Some of the, the other issues that we've started to communicate to some of the health units are, and, and they were raised actually um, from some Kairos network folks and, and Stephanie Mayel as well um, from TNO, that this, some workers have been getting their second date, uh, so the, the date of their second uh, dose of the vaccine ends up being um, after their return date back home. Um, so that's been a concern that people have been raising to the health unit saying, you know, it, it really becomes really needed to ask workers when their date of return is um, to be able to figure that out. Um, especially for example, Moderna is, is a vaccine being used at the airport and in some of the regional vaccinations and Moderna is not available in Mexico. So we, you know, started flagging what that looks like if, if a worker gets a Moderna vaccine here and is supposed to return before the second dose, what happens for that second dose if it's not available in Mexico? So we've been, we've been um, engaging with health units as well as with the, air, air, um, the vaccine airport initiative around those topics. And there's a few others as well. And things are still unclear because as we know, the, their vaccine do, um, shipments have been reduced in, in certain points, right? Um, including of Moderna. So health units are, are not necessarily being clear as to whether they're going to be able to prioritize that second dose for workers amidst what's happening across the province. So, so still a lot of work to figure out for sure. Thank you, Eduardo, so much for sharing your insights into this. I know it's a very wide, wide field and it's just rolling out, but it's important um, to to center the workers in that process, which I think is what all of us have really been doing uh, through this conversation. Uh, we will be having a webinar um, in this series specifically about the vaccines and I'll let you know which one that's gonna be um, because this is a very vital topic. And as the rollout progresses across Canada, um, it's important to uh, look at the interplay between the vaccination rollout and uh, migrant workers as well. Um, while we're on the subject, um, there were a few questions, just checking on, um, uh, we'll stick with vaccines for now. So um, are there portable vaccination agencies like bands or nurses available available to go out to farms? Do we know if that's rolling out? I know we talked about the pilot uh, project, but um, I'm assuming that through this, uh, if it's refused at the airport, there would be opportunity on the farm to accept the vaccine? Or... Yes, that's, um, we've, we've heard that that's uh, a, a thing. So we've heard that the that the, the airport vaccination is communicating with regional vaccinations to then 
uh, the idea was that they were going to then supply the second dose in the community if the times matched up. Now that's a bit less clear. But yes, um, within the, the community vaccinations, it's a mixed batch between centralized locations where workers um, through their employers are being directed to those centralized locations. So, for example, in Windsor, Essex, they started their their cent their their main or the health unit's main vaccination uh, clinic started uh, this past weekend. Um, and there they are going for a centralized location. So workers are are being registered through their the farms and then transported to that centralized location to get the vaccine. Some of the other initiatives are are, are more mobile vaccination clinics. Um, and so the health units. So it seems to be a bit different in each region. Um, some of the uh, there. So Windsor Essex health units said that they wouldn't be doing mobile ones, but other health healthcare practitioners in Windsor Essex who who are okay to vac uh, vaccinate could be doing um, specific farm and, and actual kind of outreach clinics. But in other regions like in Niagara, it seems like theirs might also be outreach clinics. So it seems to be a bit of a, of a mixed batch. Um, but we're just hoping that communication is very well established between all of them, right? Because there was also, we had started hearing where one group were kind of registering or preliminarily registering some farms where then the health unit was also going to contact. So that was kind of something that uh, that we were worried about. Um, in terms of some of the feedback from the airport vaccinations too, um, there was talk about really making sure we're, we're talking to communities about whether they've received a vaccine um, prior to coming. And that was something that, uh, you know, volunteers were kind of catching that uh, some workers were not necessarily flagging um, right away that they had received a vaccine back home. Um, this was mostly among uh, communities, uh, Mexican worker communities. Um, and there was still some kind of misconceptions around maybe the benefits of getting another vaccine and maybe not as clear around, you know, that that might not, you know, that that needs to be unpacked and, and you want the vaccine to be the same vaccine and all that stuff. Um, you know, uh, one of those cases was flagged really close to a worker in the line of getting the vaccine. So then once that was figured out, it became a conversation that started uh, more uh, overtly, I guess, with workers to say, anybody who's gotten a vaccine, you know, let us know, because we then, you know, need to follow up with you. And that then became kind of a, it seems to like it, it became more of a, a discussion. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Alfredo, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, no, no, just because you mentioned the, um, we're hoping to have a webinar on vaccines. Mm -hmm. That will be on June the 1st. June 1st. Just okay. wanted to share that. And then later on, we can share information on the in the, in the rest of our upcoming webinars too. Um, I saw earlier that Donna had her hand up. Did you still have a question? And if not, there's another in the chat. All right. Well, in the meantime, uh, there's a question from Ashley from Unknown Neighbors. Uh, does anyone have suggestions or strategies they can share on some ways of locating temporary foreign workers? A majority of the farms I've reached out to say they don't employ temporary foreign workers. This has been kind of a theme through a lot of the uh, a lot of the webinars, and it does make that direct piece difficult, but if anybody could speak to that, go ahead. Uh, Fanny's on mute. Oh. Yeah. So um, my name is Fanny and I'm working for Kairos. Um, in the Simco area, what we do is we um, go to the supermarkets. Uh, Walmart, we go to Food Basics, we go to um, uh, we go to um, a, a superstore, we go to the bank, and uh, we have CIPC, Canada Trust, Royal Bank, uh, BMO. And usually if you go on a Friday or Saturday, they are, um, the workers are coming to town this year. Like we, um, it, it's not like last year where workers were not able to come out. This year, we've seen a lot of workers coming to town shopping. So those are um, some of the ways to reach out to migrant workers and um, deliver flyers and let them know that um, you're there for them. And also, we 
um, check the newspapers because <laughs> usually when there is um, there is a farm that has a uh, COVID-19, um, it will be in the paper. And then you find out through the farm that there are some other farms that hire migrant workers. And that's how we reach out. And um, the farms in our area, they've been really, uh, they, we, have, we, we didn't have any trouble talking to the employers. And so you just knock at the door. Um, usually they have a big sign, do not enter. We call, we are at the door of the, the office. We call them and then they come out. And so those, those are the ways banks, supermarkets um, are the ways to reach out to migrant workers. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a question in the chat for Stacy. Um, you talked about um, uh, Dorothy is wondering if you can say a bit more about what the health and safety issues are that have been going on. Yes. Uh, so, yes, uh, happy to share. And also here is Noe. Uh, Noe is also supporting uh, with the Migrant Workers Program here in Nova Scotia. Hello and welcome. Um, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I talked about some of the safety concerns um, that existed uh, before the, the pandemic and how they're being exacerbated during COVID-19. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I think that's also something that Noe uh, can speak about as well. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to share. I had mentioned a few things uh, such as uh, hazards, uh, such as uh, pesticides, uh, lack of access to uh, safety equipment. Um, those are some of, the, some of the things that have been directly mentioned that have existed uh, prior to the pandemic. Also during the pandemic, um, so for example, I'm not sure if it's the case also in Ontario, but um, workers in the food sector, um, so they're exempt from the social distancing uh, measures. Um, so the employer is supposed to uh, reduce the amount of kind of, um, is supposed to find ways to, to reduce the, the risks to, to migrant workers, but, uh, but they're exempt uh, from, uh, from uh, social, like physical distancing uh, in the workplace, which makes it hard for them to uh, refuse uh, work uh, that is unsafe in this context. And so uh, with, with our group and other uh, organizations that are part of the Migrant Worker Rights Working Group, uh, we've been calling for a removal of that uh, that exemption uh, for workers in that sector. Um, so that's uh, that's something uh, recently uh, that uh, we've been well since the since COVID something that we've been advocating around. Um, and I also I, I wonder if Noah might also have other things to add to this to this question as well. Si si quieres puedo traducir. Okay. Yo siento que la seguridad en las casas, bueno, como viviendas que están como a punto de colapsar, ¿no? La última visita que hicimos era, se miran que las casas son como abandonadas. ¿no? Uh -huh. uh, so no es also, no es talking about, uh, so safety in terms of housing uh, is also an issue. Uh, so recently, uh, he saw some housing uh, where migrant workers are living that is at the point of almost collapsing, uh, that look like they're like abandoned housing. Que también en, en lo de los procesos, digamos, de seguridad o esto, de, que tienen que haber instrucciones, yo creo que nunca hay las suficientes instrucciones, no que más bien como amenaza, ¿no? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
so also uh, in terms of the workplace, uh, another issue around security is lack of uh, instruction and training uh, around uh, issues in the workplace. Como ahorita con el COVID, es como les hablan nada más de, de la multa que podrían obtener mm -hmm. y no cómo evitar o cómo no conseguirse. Uh, so with COVID, for example, uh, when the employer talks to the workers about COVID, they talk about the fine uh, that they might receive Um, but they don't talk about how they could uh, prevent uh, getting sick. Uh, the, that's, that's it for now, I think. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Dorothy, uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Hi. Um, so my name is Dorothy Wigmore. I'm working with the OCAL folks um, around this uh, migrant uh, worker project and doing uh, the toolkit, a toolkit for workers and some other things. Um, but I wanted to let folks know that we'll have the link for you, hopefully by the time this, this uh, session's over. Um, we're April 28th is what they call the day of mourning for workers killed and injured on the job. It's Now uh, it's year 35. Uh, it started here in Canada. It's now on around, goes on around the world. Um, and so um, we came up with the idea of doing a webinar uh, for this network and for others who are interested in, in migrant worker uh, health and safety on the 28th. Um, and uh, it'll be from 1.30 till 3. And uh, as I said, we'll have um, a link to put in the chat box um, hopefully before things are over. But uh, that was really helpful, uh, Stacy. And I'm sorry, I'm awful on names. Your friend's name. Uh, Gracias. No, eh? Gracias, senor. Uh, uh, so it's just, I think, you know, there's a real connection between the health and safety issues and living issues and um, things around the vaccine. And, you know, uh, so um, anyway. Uh, we'll be talking more about that on the 28th and hope you can join us. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, please put the link to that in the chat so that we can connect. Um, yep, Connie, you can go ahead. Hi. Um, I just want you know, well, first of all, hi, Nguyen. I haven't seen you for a while, and it's so good to see you, you know, at this webinar. Nguyen um, was a um, yeah, temporary foreign worker in Quebec and was has been very active with the Immigrant Workers Center there, and now he's in Nova Scotia, helping, you know, uh, workers in, in Nova Scotia. Um, I just want to, you know, uh, to, to say that our topic, you know, this afternoon is very, very important and very relevant in terms of how, you know, how we make uh, migrant farm workers welcome uh, in our communities and how can we support them, uh, considering that we've been saying all the while that these workers are essential, you know, to ensure that, you know, there's food on our table and other uh, essential services. Um, Jane and uh, Stacy referred to the current project that Kairos is, uh, is partnering with Service Canada and in the process of implementing these projects, we are in partnerships with about you know, uh, 13 uh, community organizations that are in partnership with about 70 other community organizations. This project is very, is very short term. Uh, this is going to be ending in, in June, end of June, June 30th. However, migrant workers have been coming and will be coming throughout, you know, throughout the years. And in as much as we, as we are using, you know, the CARIC funding to support local communities, local organizations, and hoping that, you know, with, with your continued support and continued commitment of our community partners, this work, this support, uh, this assistance to migrant workers, you know, continue. So one of our 
kind of one of our objective or kind of aspiration in this afternoon's webinar is to open it up for everyone to sort of uh, share what you are doing in your communities and strategize on how we can do a more coordinated community approach, uh, working together, collaborating together to continue the support that, you know, we are already extending. Hi, Ella and Richard. Um, uh, Ella and Richard are very active in Linden. And of course, you know, we have uh, Ashley with Unknown Neighbors in Collingwood. And uh, I saw Joe Bissina with uh, the, um, the Diocese of London in the Windsor Essex area. So let's, let's you know, uh, share and, and try to uh, share, you know, what you are already doing and how can we sustain it uh, beyond June 30th. Thank you. Yes, in uh, developing this webinar, um, I, as someone who prior to January was completely disconnected from this issue, was wondering about ways that where um, just like interested people who aren't working in the field can participate uh, and what they can offer to, uh, to support migrant workers. Uh, and I've gotten a lot of uh, great tips for people from uh, Jane and Stacy, but um, if there are other people from other organizations who are looking for volunteers or um, have programming that could benefit from, uh, from sort of a mass of people getting involved, uh, feel free to add that into, into this webinar. If I might add, um, I'm very grateful for um, this um, ability to be able to connect with uh, our opportunity to connect with people from across Canada. Um, as many of you know, the farm workers are usually um, like in our area, they're just here for a specific amount of time. Then a lot of them that come up later will then transfer to Collingwood and Brighton, some of, as far as Nova Scotia for the apple harvest. And then we get calls from there saying, Jane, I need to see a doctor or I need a new pair of shoes and all, all manner of things that people need in the course of living. And um, we have nowhere to start to be able to hook them up. Um, Last year, a number of ladies were in Collingwood with all kinds of needs. They'd never been there before um, and had not been told the truth about where they were going to harvest and just found themselves alone and isolated and very worried because they didn't have proper winter clothing to harvest apples. So knowing now that there's connections in Collingwood is just really helpful and encouraging, as well as Halifax and across the country. So this kind of information is also invaluable um, to all of us actually. So I really appreciate everybody's input today. I think Ella raised her hand earlier. Yep. Ella, you can mute. Um, one thing we find, I, David just mentioned, you know, as far as volunteers, we'll get a call a day before a rain and the guys will say, we have no work, we're stuck in the bunkhouse. We'd like to practice English. So we got the book from Frontier College. We reprinted, it's about 10 or $12 to reprint. We put a plasticized cover on and we, we give it to the workers that are interested. We've just done a pilot, but they'll call us up the night before. They'll say, can you, can you call us? Can you practice English with us tomorrow at four? So um, I just find there's a real need to practice English or on Sundays that'll happen. Um, and then we have a bicycle shop that gives us a discount. So we tune up bicycles when it's not COVID time, when people aren't restricted, we tune up bicycles and then we sell them for $25 um, to the workers. Some of them ask us to store their bike for the next season. So then we store it. Um, so those are, and then we do food drops. We get, um, we get certified organic food and we give it to our friends and we do food drops at farms. Uh, but this year we can't see any workers. So we, we take it to the farmer. Um, Thank you, Ella. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, Sharon in the chat says a few of us in Brighton 
have had to work hard to access medical care for workers since their working hours don't match with medical clinic hours. Uh, what have others done in regards to this issue? Anyone in particular with <laughs> insights into this? I think, yeah, there are significant difficulties with, um, uh, you know, not every locality has 24 hour uh, medical care or easily accessible um, medical care um, that has those extended hours. So, um, I mean, that could be another opportunity for um, volunteers uh, to expand services. Connie? I'm going to put Donna on this part. <laughs> <laughs> Donna. Um, I knew you were going to do that. I've been, uh, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've just been here, you know, trying to hold back because there are so many things that, you know, migrant workers need. Just simply um, having someone who can, you know, call them to say, how are you doing? It's just so important. Um, you know, we need volunteers to, you know, to, to drive them to, to for their medical appointments to sometimes to um, to get groceries, especially with COVID, with some um, items that are, you know, when they go to the grocery store, it's not available. Um, you know, I would get calls and say, you know, can you pick up, you know, can you pick up some some yam for me, or can you pick up medication, um, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, just knowing that there's somebody who can who can help them out you know during this time is, is very important um I, I also volunteer with an organization called caribbean workers outreach project and we are connected to the united church and um in, in the past what we have been doing is connecting spiritually so uh we have sunday night services which is the guys tremendously um love to attend even now they're saying you know they're saying um, when are we going to get together? Um, can we actually do like a Zoom, um, you know, serve worship service on a Sunday morning? So, the, you know, there, there are calls for that. Um, we do domino competitions um, and, you, you know, um, you know, rival with, um, with, with Vineland. Uh, we also do a, a cricket competition, which is, which is a great pastime for, for Jamaicans. So just being able to, to get that social aspect in there. Um, we have volunteers who will, you know, on their own time will invite workers over for dinner or they'll take them out on an excursion. You know, just that, just simple things like that, that help to, to, to connect, to build community, to, to let our migrant workers feel, you know, very welcome, like that they're part of our community. It's, it's so very important. And I mean, um, thanks, Jane. Um, Jane is kind of like my mentor for in the Niagara region because she does so much for migrant workers. But uh, I mean, the guys, um, you know, just showing them how much we appreciate them and how much we care that they lead their families every year to, um, you know, to spend six, seven, eight months here, you know, just to provide, um, to put foods on our table. Thank you, Donna. Um, what we are also planning at Kairos is organize, you know, uh, a local ecumenical meetings uh, in, in areas where we have already community partners and in areas where there's a huge, you know, concentration of, uh, of migrant farm workers. So for example, we've, uh, we've Shannon is here with us. Uh, uh, we've been in touch with Father Peter, for example, in in Cinco, and you know, kind of requesting, okay, who are the community churches that are in the area that we can, you know, uh, we can call on and we can organize a meeting and and just find out if they are also doing or providing services to migrant workers in the area, or if not, how can you know, how can we 
we start ecumenically. As you know, Kairos is an ecumenical organizations and organization, and we have member churches in in almost all of the areas where there are migrant workers. So that's one way of you know drawing uh, drawing in uh, local churches and faith groups uh, to yeah to start kind of you know providing support and and assistance in whatever way uh, they can, but really you know get engaged and become part of this community action that you know we are doing. Um, Shannon, if you want to say a little bit more on that. Uh, just to say that we have, um, we've not reached out to all of our partner organizations yet in every area. We just sort of picked a few that we knew were um, sort of uh, where there were lots of churches around and we uh, were ready to reach out there. Um, we're slowly setting some dates. If there are uh, folks on this call who would be keen to have that sort of meeting in their area to garner more support for your um, organization or for the work that you're doing or to just see more initiatives begun, um, reach out to us and we'd be happy to partner together to, uh, uh, you know, use, use your contacts, our contacts and, and put together an invitation where we can share the work, share that is being done and share the needs that are there and invite more people to be involved. Thank you, Shannon. David, if I might just add, it's Donna here. Yep. Um, another very important way we were able to connect with migrant workers is um, through Caribbean Workers Outreach. Uh, we would bring um, two ministers um, from Jamaica um, to, mm -hmm. to the Niagara and the Vineland um, sides. Mm -hmm. And they would spend um, uh, five weeks each year, all expenses paid. And what they would do is they would actually go to the farms like in the evenings and visit with the guys, you know, just minister, uh, minister to them you know, just see how they're doing and that kind of stuff. And they really, really appreciate knowing that they have a minister who who um, speaks the same language, who understands culturally, you know, um, these kind of things that they're going through. And I found that to be very effective. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much. Uh, Shannon has put her email in the chat. Um, if uh, you're interested in partnering for the an ecumenical meeting. Uh, and there is also the Eventbrite link for the OCAO uh, health and safety webinar as well. Uh, and if you want to save the chat, it's just three little dots and then click save chat and you're good. Um, May I also um, mention okay. an idea from that a local church is doing? Um, and uh, Southridge Church in Vineland has probably one of the most effective uh, farm worker outreaches in Canada, I would say. And last year they managed to have a social night, um, one or two nights a week by inviting the farm so that they're coming in their own hub and their own bubble. So there was no concern about cross contamination between farms. So they would have their nights of ping pong and pool and watching movies, video games, that kind of thing. So they've been very innovative about how to create some um, very important diversions for guys to, even though it's the same bubble, but at least they're different activities and they're off the farm and it involves food, which is wonderful. So, um, so there's some of the ideas with Southridge um, church in Vineland, which um, you can just Google them and contact Nate Dirks, and I'm sure he'd be happy to fill you in on ideas. Um, traditionally in August, well, for uh, about eight years, I did the Workers' Welcome concert, which we eventually just outgrew because we didn't have room for a venue that had room for a thousand people. So it evolved into the Peach Pickers picnic starting in 2017, and we continued for three years. The last year we fed a thousand people. It was a phenomenal turnout. Now, of course, we can't do that because of COVID. But one of the things we're considering is doing a pop-up concert with delivering meals at the same time. And just getting a trailer, putting a kit of drums on it and a little portable speaker, uh, one mic, and uh, just 
properly distancing, but just pulling around to the farms, doing two or three songs, dropping off a meal, moving on to the next farm um, before we can get busted, <laughs> essentially. But, um, and again, it would just be pulling off the road uh, safely and just letting the guys know you are not alone delivering watermelon, snacks, whatever, whatever the budget will allow. Um, and um, I think there's many different ways we can be creative about this while still respecting all of the protocols, because ultimately that's what's Im most important, that you respect everybody's health and keep everybody safe. But this is part of um, the stress, dealing with the stress levels and the mental health issues are um, of increasing concern. When there have been mental breakdowns in the past year, just due to all the accumulation of stress, isolation, fear for their families, they just get sent home. Um, and it's been very, very concerning to hear about these stories a year after the fact that we didn't even know about this because there's the shame and stigma attached of people having um, the inability to cope with such huge amounts of stress. They don't have the resources we do and they have the added levels of shame and stigma, which many of us are now more open about if we're suffering with depression, whatever, we recognize the signs, we, we can be proactive about some things, at least if we see it in family members. But for these guys, it goes unrecognized until it gets built up to a breaking point. And so, um, so just to recognize the, the uh, needs to support their mental health and reduce some of this stress, which can just be silly stuff, which can be, yeah, maybe a pop-up concert. Um, the fellow that headlined at the concert, we used him in the COVID video or in the vaccination video. And uh, he, he is amazing. We'll probably use him, stick him on the back of a, a trailer and just go farm to farm, two songs each, but these little spur of the moment things that are very low budget, no, we're usually used to working with no budget. So, but we never let that stop us. We just go ahead and do it. So that's another idea too. Music is really um, a big boost to the guys. So another fellow um, we were able to purchase a keyboard for, he does have internet provided on his farm. So we hope he's gonna be able to do some recording and we can share that online as well, just to, um, allow them to share their voices, that they will be heard, and that their, their voices are important for encouraging their own peers. That's hugely important in connecting them. Um, I want to pick up on what you, what you shared earlier about, you know, partnering with community, local, local community business mm -hmm. in terms of being able to provide, for example, the Wi-Fi hotspot mm -hmm. in, in the because it's it's one of the you know major issues that many of the workers are facing in terms of isolation and not being able to connect to their families, especially during emergencies, if something happened in the bank house and 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 so forth. So um I wonder if you can, you know, just say that again and, and just, you know, for, for our participants here to take, you know, uh, some inspiration and kind of uh, how to do, how to, how to do it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, it was a huge success with, uh, with our own library. They only had two Wi-Fi hotspots. So I connected them with the farms most in need and advocated on their behalf that they shouldn't have to return them after two weeks. And it was actually what prompted that move. Um, I wasn't even that familiar with what hotspots did two years ago, but one of the fellows on the farm was actually having a breakdown of sorts. His, his wife had left him in Jamaica and took the kids with him. He um, had no idea where she was going. It was really a very serious situation to the point he started digging his own grave in behind the bunkhouse. He was going to kill himself and didn't want to make a mess. And so he started digging a hole. It was very, very frightening, very depressing and worrisome for the other guys who were quite scared what was going to happen. And I realized this is just really important for him to be able to connect at home. And where he worked and where the bunkhouse was located, it's just in a little blackout area. So 
Um, they also can't make phone calls. Like chatter doesn't work. Some of these traditional um, providers just didn't work in that area. So they'd actually have to go up to a neighboring house and try to connect to the neighbor's Wi-Fi. It was really a problem. And so I just went to the library and said, this is a real, this is a very urgent situation. We need to borrow a hotspot now. And it was just sitting there idle, not being used at the library. So I was able to get it and to have it extended till the end of the season. And I automatically asked for it the next year, but I'm realizing all over, I didn't realize how expensive the data plans were until I had to get it on my phone. And then it was because we want to communicate. Everybody needs WhatsApp to communicate to Mexico, Jamaica, wherever. And then when I had to put it on my phone, it's like, oh my gosh, this I can't afford this. But then I thought, well, I do need to communicate with them. But I just thought their, their earnings are so quickly eroded because they're supporting their household back home. They also have internet fees back home. And now with COVID, it's gone through the roof with them having to pay if they have two or three kids at school doing it online, the internet is eating up such a huge cost of their wages up here. So um, it, they just, they end up not buying enough groceries and just scrimping and other things because the online costs and staying in touch are so high. So um, I got frustrated and, and I've been asking the library for the last two years, how can we get more Wi-Fi hotspots I was turned down all the time. It's the prohibitive. But then I found out, no, it's not prohibitive. It's $1,200. Rogers has a plan with our Niagara Lake Library. You buy the hotspot for $100, and then you purchase a two-year plan, which is $1,200. Each transponder can serve 15 um, devices at a time with unlimited internet. <laughs> well, this works out to $50 a month. So if you guys have 15 guys chipping in $5 a month instead of $50 a piece, that's a huge saving. And the internet is unlimited and, um, and it goes everywhere. There's no blackout areas. Like it works close to the, our problem is the Niagara River and proximity to the US. There's no problems with these hotspots. So Rotary wanted to contribute $500 to the welcome kits yesterday. I said, can we use it towards this? Here's the need, and I did all the background information. There are other libraries. Um, Kitchener Waterloo has 82 hotspots that they loan out. You know, uh, Wellington County, Meaford, the Rotary there paid for their new hotspots. Why can't we work with other community organizations to serve underserved rural areas until 5G kicks in or whatever? We can solve this problem now immediately. And so yesterday, Rotary kicked in enough for three more hotspots and the contracts, which I was not expecting, but people are anxious to do something. And this is a very tangible mm -hmm. way that makes a difference immediately. And it also helps us to connect within our community. It's not just back home. It's us. We want to learn what's happening with our neighbors who are stuck in quarantine. Are their families okay in St. Vincent? Like this is important for all of us, right? And their kids back home need help with their homework. And they're calling their dads, can you help me? I don't have data. Well, you know, it's possible. We can try to keep these families intact and um, communicating as best as possible. And this is one really good way to do it. Um, and another way for us personally for the last number of years is our house is also a post office and a delivery spot for Amazon. And I know Amazon, the... <laughs> Delivery guys think I have a real addiction, but it's actually people just sending, using our house as an address because they, this is a privilege we don't think of. We think like they can't get mail. They don't want their mail going to their employer's house. They don't want all the parcels going to their employer's house. They use my place and then I'll do a no contact drop off. And I don't support Amazon personally, but these guys have no alternative. So yeah. Um, thank you, Jane. And I just want to add, you know, that the libraries, the pi public libraries are really good to be partnered, you know, to be partnering with. For example, Durham Region for Migrant Workers Ministry are actually given, I think, um, five uh, uh, Wi-Fi spots or 
uh, hotspots and also were, you know, they were uh, lent uh, devices like tablets. Yeah. Uh, able, you know, to for the workers to connect and use the tablets. And also in the Durham region, they're partnered with Salvation Army so that her, you know, the food banks, for example, after the, you know, the, the regular clients have taken their, you know, their supply for food, whatever is left over is given, are given to the ministry and then they share it with, you know, the migrant workers in the region. So there's many ways that, you know, we can, we can continue to support. And I think the work has to start now in terms of locating who their community organizations are and in terms of partnering with them. My, my cat wants to join the conversation too. Yes, and start small, like start small, uh, enjoy some small successes, but just get going. I've never had money to start anything. In fact, I just met resistance with most of my projects. So you just start small and the success is built. And honestly, um, like the uh, local paper wanted me to write about all the volunteers that in, are involved with supporting farm workers. And I just said, we're not volunteers. This is a way of life we have chosen. Um, we choose to love our neighbors as ourselves. We don't clock off at the end of the day. We, we, don't, we don't ever stop thinking about it. This is a way of living and a way of loving. It's not a volunteer mentality. And um, as you get involved and you love them as your neighbors and as your friends, you'll find no ends of things that you can do to support them um, and enable them to use their own voices to express themselves safely. That's uh, how do we use our privilege to serve? That's all. Um, as we come to the close of the session, I was wondering if Stacy had anything else to add before we are done for the day. Thanks a lot uh, for the opportunity to speak with everyone and to connect with everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Stacy and Jane. Um, I had put the registration link for the uh, next webinar in the series in the chat, but I'll do it again. Um, it, the topic is going to be further discussing uh, open work permits and the sort of related issues um, around around them um, and uh, focusing in, of course, on empowering temporary foreign workers because, you know, that's what the project is. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for attending. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the, at the next webinar. Um, from this webinar, I'm looking to develop a resource that should be available potentially on the Kairos website. Um, so look out for that. But yes, other than that, we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. See you again.